you hear me? Is that better if we do that? Okay. okay. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, an apology. Um, this is a desert. We don't normally do rain here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but this is the only the second time in a decade of events here uh, that we've had any rain at all. Uh, and I'm afraid we just hit the unlucky morning. But thank you very much for bearing with us. And I particularly apologize to our two speakers uh, for having their sessions cut in half. But I think it's the only thing we can do this morning. Uh, and thank you for your good humor and putting up with all this. Um, could everybody in the middle sit down? I don't mind people in the middle at all, but could we have everyone down? Okay, so um, this session is on the uh, Buddhas of Bamiyan. Uh, I did a special prep for this session by flying in November uh, to Bamiyan with my family for a family holiday. I highly recommend it. It's uh, one of the safest places in Afghanistan. Um, you get beautifully looked after by the Hazara. Uh, and it has a five-star hotel which serves very good Japanese food. Uh, uh, an easy hop to Kabul, just an hour from Delhi, and another half hour, a little Tupolev will take you to the subject of this afternoon. So uh, we have two very distinguished speakers, Llewellyn Morgan, the author of uh, the, uh, the Buddhas of Bamiyan, the go-to text um, on this, uh, a, a splendid book in itself, uh, and Barry Flood, who is a uh, professor of art history, specialist in iconoclasm and early Islam, uh, and uh, he will be telling the story of destruction while Llewellyn will open now uh, by uh, telling the history. Could everybody quieten down at the back, please? Could we have no chit-chat? Uh, that is, could the volunteers keep everyone quiet? Please, no more. Okay, go, Llewellyn. Right, splendid. Um, am I audible? Yes, brilliant. Okay, no, I remember that Japanese uh, hotel very fondly <laughs> as well. I remember staring across at the, the Buddha clip uh, at Bamiyan, eating Japanese food whilst blondie played on the uh, iPad to my <laughs> side. It, it seemed, uh, well, it's, it's, that's a theme of um, the, the meeting of cultures, which is, which is what I'm talking about uh, here in the time I have. Can I start off, though, with a, uh, a quotation from um, Barry Flood from 2002, which was tremendously acute and, 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 and prophetic, because what he said at that point, um, discussing the Buddhas of Bamiyan was there can be little doubt that the recent destruction of the Buddhas of Bamiyan will define Islamic iconoclasm in the popular agenda for several decades to come. And what I think is very striking about the way Bamiyan is talked about and has been talked about for the last decade and more um, is how um, it, it is um, always without um, exception cited when Um, so whether we're talking about what happened in uh, Timbuktu, in, in Mali, what is continuing to happen in ISIS-controlled areas in Syria, um, in Iraq, even what's happening or what's said to be happening in uh, connection with archaeological uh, excavations in um, Afghanistan, on ongoing archaeological excavations, Bamiyan is the, is the point of reference uh, whenever any destruction to cultural heritage is, uh, is, is, is proposed. The disturbing rider to that, though, is the strong impression one gets that if Bamiyan is, as it were, a need, um, whenever we're thinking about cultural destruction, it works as a need for the people that are doing the destruction as well. Um, the jihadists, or whatever we want to, to, to call them, who seem so determined at various times um, to destroy ancient materials and historical materials, are themselves seems to me, inspired by the impact that Bamiyan had in 2001. Because what they learned from the events in 2001 was that destroying uh, a monument or monuments like the Buddhas of Bamiyan was, from their point of view, an excellent way of grabbing the attention of the world, um, alienating the people they wanted to alienate, bringing on side the people they wanted to bring on side and having it all without um, it certainly um, performed on news programs um, across um, the world. 
Now, when I was writing about um, Marmion, rightly or wrongly, it was the most joyous year of my life, actually. He's been a very melancholic subject, but a fabulous thing to be, to be um, researching. Rightly or wrongly, though, I took Barmian as the kind of encapsulation, the epitome of its wider environment, of, of um, the geography of the Hindu Kush in the heart of which it lies, but also the geography and the politics that derive from the geography of Afghanistan um, around it. And to put things very simply and, and, and swiftly, as I need to um, this morning, Afghanistan is a meeting place, um, a, a crossroad. Um, familiarly. And Bamiyan lay on the trade route which connected um, Central Asia, Iran, um, potentially China at various points in the history of the trade routes in this area, and of course um, India. That position of Bamiyan left it um, a wonderfully richly complex uh, place. The Buddhas themselves were display the influence of, uh, of the Gupta style of sculpture. At the same time, there are elements of sort of Greek um, 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 uh, representations of hair and, and such, such things. Um, the people that lived in, in Bamiyan were Iranians who followed an Indian religion. Um, their, their Iranian language at the time the Buddhas were constructed was probably written in Greek script. You know, this is a, a wonderfully um, complex place that its position, its geographical position, had, uh, had created. My point, of course, here is that the Hindu Kush and Bamiyan at the heart of the Hindu Kush, and indeed Afghanistan more widely, is uh, a melting pot. But melting pots always have the potential, always contain the ingredients to become not so much places of meeting and greeting, but places of um, conflict between the cultures that, that make them up. And uh, this is far too simplistic, and I could argue this at greater length, but I very much see the act of the destruction of the Buddhas in, in 2001 as um, an attempt to separate cultures, an attempt to generate conflict um, between uh, cultures. Um, one way I would make that argument very quickly is that um, if you, I don't encourage you to do this because it's a depressing thing, but if you go on YouTube and listen to the things that bin Laden was saying in 2001 after 9-11, um, he takes iconoclasm, the destruction of idols, and turns it into, or makes of it a metaphor for his much, much wider um, uh, agenda. Um, so he talks about America as uh, as Kubat. So he turns America um, metaphorically into um, the idol that uh, Muhammad found at the Kaaba and, and, and removed. That America is an idol that must be destroyed, just as the Buddhas were idols that had to be destroyed. Um, well, that's how I understand um, what happened at, at Bamiyan, an assertion of um, Islamic values according to this jihadist view of things, which would sort of establish a them enough situation, establish a, uh, in Islam in conflict with the West and a West in conflict with Islam. It's a very familiar um, strategy, and one regrets to say that it's been a tremendously successful strategy. Um, it's, well, it's, I don't need to provide examples of that. But let me end with um, some kind of antidote to it, something um, that I think is much truer to the history of Bamiyan under uh, it, it, when inhabited by Islamic people, which you know the Buddhas survived for 1,200 years, uh, it's effectively unscathed, um, uh, 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 at least uh, 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 an Islamic people. What I'm about to quote here, very very briefly, is an amazing little text which um, survived in a book called the Theories of I Ibn al Nadim, and the, the Theories is a essentially a a uh, little compendium of the things that an intelligent man in 10th century Baghdad needed to know. And this text that I'm about to quote is written in Arabic. It's the product of um, Islamic contacts with India and a particular family, the Barmakids, who are very interested in what's happening in India for just historical reasons that I can't go, go into. What 
this text represents, though, for me, what I was maybe most excited about it, is that it's the best account of what the religious experience was like of going to Bamiyan when you were Buddhist, of approaching the Buddhas as a Buddhist. Um, some huge, impressive monuments. Just to repeat, it is written in Arabic. Very, very short indeed as well, I promise. <laughs> so, the people of India go on pilgrimage, pilgrimages to these two idols, bearing with them offerings, incense, and fragrant wood. If the eye should fall upon them from a distance, a man would be obliged to lower his eyes, overawed by them. If he is lacking in attention or careless when he sees them, it is necessary for him to return to a place from which he cannot view them and then to approach them, keeping them as an object for his attention with reverence for them. I love the fact that's written in, in Arabic about Buddhist um, observation. Thank you. Well, and just before we um, hand over to Barry, um, a particular bit I enjoyed in the book is where you quote a Victorian uh, Sabi, William Simpson, uh, mm. imagining a meeting of all the different colossi yes. of the world. Could you just summarize that? Uh, uh, just you haven't actually established the size of these things. Yes, yet. yes. Okay, so, so th this is William um, Simpson, who's, who's um, he's working on material that had been sent to, sent to him by, by the Afghan Border Commission, a bunch of sort of British uh, officers who are wandering all around Afghanistan, just going a long way away from the border for whatever reason. What should the British be up to? Anyway, they go to, um, to uh, Bamiyan and, and they, just off, they produce the most accurate um, measurements and indeed images of uh, Buddha that had, that had yet been uh, created. And uh, um, Simpson is, is back in, in London writing for the Illustrated London News and he's got somehow to convey how big they are. And first of all, he has an image um, which compares the larger Buddha at Bamiyan, 55 meters uh, tall, it's very, very tall. The, the entrance, the tragedy, tragedy that it's entered, but still an incredibly impressive thing to, to, to look at. The larger um, Buddha is there, it's compared uh, to its advantage with um, various uh, uh, statues. It, an Egyptian statue is one of them, I think. The only monument that's allowed to be slightly taller than it, than it is, is, is the London Monument which is a, a pillar in, in London that commemorates the great fire of, of London. But he has a wonderful little um, story associated with, with it, where he imagines all these great monuments of an, antiquity, um, uh, Baidiatu um, creations in, in Greece and Egyptian um, uh, monoliths and, and so on, all coming to a sort of an annual, annual general meeting of, um, <laughs> of, of, of big statues um, and being overawed. By, by the larger Buddha at Bamiyan, which, which, which just looms over, over all. There's a lovely line where he says that uh, if the Egyptian ones could stand up, <laughs> they would be so high. <laughs> right. Right. Um, before we go on to Barry, could, could we please have silence on the balcony? Uh, and could the volunteers just encourage people not to chit chat there? This is a session going on here. Thank you. You will be able to hear it better, uh, Barry. My involvement with the Bamiyan Buddhas comes right at the end of their, their life story and the, the tragic events of 2002 in the run-up to the destruction of the Buddhas when the Taliban were issuing various edicts um, that were circulating in the, the Western media. Um, and I noticed a discrepancy between the way in which the, the, these events were being reported as part of a continuum, a historical continuum of Islamic iconoclasm and what the Taliban were actually saying, which nobody really was listening to uh, at the time. And a couple of things struck me. One was how there was an attempt being made to create a historical genealogy for this act. So Mahmoud and Ghazni and all the usual suspects were being invoked. Um, but also the, the spectacle of the destruction and the paradox that it was leading to an image of destruction because that was the end point of video of the destruction which was circulated with text from the Quran recording Ibrahim's destruction of the idols of his people, the foundational act of monotheism. Um, so there were a number of paradoxes involved in this, and at a certain point, the Taliban, the, the director of the Metropolitan Museum in New York offered reportedly, uh, I think erroneously, was reported in the media to, uh, to want to buy the Buddhas to protect them. And the Taliban actually issued an edict in response, quoting Mahmoud Ghazni in terms of Somnath, um, when re 
reportedly the preacher from that tribe who ran from the idols, and should I be known to history as a broker of idols or a breaker of idols? Um, so I, I started trying to put together an analysis of these events, which eventually took me rather far from the standard media interpretation of a kind of historical continuum, which is exactly what the Taliban wanted to suggest, that this stood in a long line of acts that were really the same kind of acts. And in fact, it seemed to me rather different for many reasons. One, because it was a spectacle that would exploited the global media in a way that was new, especially um, uh, video, digital video technology, the circulation of uh, videos. The other was that the religious rhetoric didn't hold up uh, to much analysis. For example, the, 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 basic, uh, the basic text that um, promotes attitudes in it among the pious, and of course not everybody is, is pious, um, recommends two things when it comes to figural imagery. Either you can recontextualize the image, put it in a place where it's not disturbing you and where it can't be used for idolatry, or you can remove a part of the image, in which case it's perfectly acceptable. We have, at the time of the Taliban, 1,500 years of Islamic jurisprudence that built on these precepts that all says the same thing, that essentially, if you remove a part of the image, even an anthropomorphic image, it's perfectly acceptable. The faces of the Buddhas were removed in antiquity. They were probably masks because slot just below the jaw of the larger Buddha, where you can see how masks would have been slid in. That was lost in antiquity. In other words, the Buddhas were defaced in antiquity and were therefore perfectly acceptable from a juridical point of view within the norms of juridical distinguished Islam. As the, uh, the Fukaha, the, the jurist of al Azhar, the most famous Sunni university in the world, announced, I mean, they denounced the Taliban, but there's absolutely no justification for this. So what I argued, eventually I wrote an article on this offering a different analysis, that this had nothing to do with piety or religiosity or all the rhetorical things that were invoked. It really had to do with geopolitics. It was the first real instance in which the designation of monuments as cultural heritage led to their targeting by a group that rejected the idea of the community of nations. Um, that rejected the very idea of the nation state that underwrites these charters on cultural heritage, um, uh, patrimony, all these things. Um, and so what I suggested is that, in, in fact, this was really the first case of something that might become more widespread, which is, in fact, what happened, um, where so-called cultural heritage was targeted in order to make a point to the larger international community and in order to produce images of destruction which would then circulate as propaganda um, tools. As a result of that article, I was asked to write a book on the idea of anachronism and iconoclasm in relation to Islam, this deeply rooted idea that somehow Islam has a different relationship to the image. Um, and so I began writing a book which I imagine would take about two years, that was 13 years ago. Um, <laughs> that there's, a, there's a moral in this story somewhere. Um, but the book is really about two things. The first is the history of the idea of an image problem in Islam. The second is thinking about uh, theological Islam, but particularly political Islam, and what did the jurists actually say about images? And the most interesting thing for me has been the lack of a consensus. Nowhere in this tradition do you find an absolute unanimity, an absolute consensus. It's a very, very varying thing, an extremely interesting Landscape. Many of the things the jurists have to say about images are extremely interesting and relevant to the sort of work that the art historian, uh, the modern art historian, contemporary art historian, is doing. The other thing I found was that there are historical moments, especially in the 19th century, when anxieties about images in theological Islam, which are not shared by everybody, can be mobilized in the service of an anti-colonial agenda. There's a very good instance in Egypt in 1882, Egypt is the first country to introduce monumental figurative sculpture, public figures, figurative sculpture. The Khadij, the ruler of Egypt, um, Ismail in the 1870s, hires a bunch of French sculptors to decorate the new city of Cairo with massive equestrian statues of his family. <coughs> this is a moment when there's tension about the degree of Europeanization in Egypt, the role of British and French bankers. In 1882, there's a revolt led by um, an army captain uh, called Ahmed El Rabi. It's a, an anti-colonial revolt. It's specifically against the Qadi, that is entanglement with the European powers. The first thing that Ahmed El Rabi does is ask for a fatwa against the statues of the Qadi. 
Now, the reason he does this, I suspect, is not because he's a deeply pious person, but because the question of public stature is uniquely suited to mobilize public opinion for several reasons. First of all, because it was very novel in Egypt in the 19th century, but more importantly, because if there is any consensus among the good, it's that statues are really problematic. When it comes to other kinds of images, there's absolutely no consensus. But there is near unanimity on the, the question of the statue, a three-dimensional statue. The, the question of statue is uniquely suited to mobilize um, public opinion at these moments of tension about especially the relationship to the West. And what I would suggest is we can look back to the 19th century and see precedent for what happened in Spanion, where religious rhetoric is used in the service of what is in fact an anti-colonial um, agenda. The second thing I would uh, suggest, and this may be harder to swallow, but is that the, the, the events of 2002, the destruction of the Banyan Buddhas, are usually framed in terms of religious iconoclasm. Now, I've just suggested that we need to take apart that rhetoric, and when we do, it doesn't bear much scrutiny, that this isn't really religious iconoclasm, this is religious rhetoric mobilized in the service of geopolitics. I think an interesting comparison for the, the destruction of the Banyan Buddhas in 2002 is an event that happened a year later that was also a spectacle of image destruction staged for the global media, who were invited. In fact, it was timed like the Banyan episode so that the global media would be there. And this is the destruction of the statue of Sir Ramsay III in Sir Dal Square in Baghdad in April 2003 that was, we now know was staged by the US military um, for the global media as a spectacle of uh, apparent liberation. Um, What's interesting to me about that act is that, that that's usually presented as an act of secular iconoclasm, uh, political iconoclasm, as opposed to the religious iconoclasm of the Banyan Buddhas. Um, I would suggest that if the rhetoric of the Banyan, the religious rhetoric of, of the Taliban about Banyan, doesn't hold much water, doesn't hold up to scrutiny, the same is true of the idea that the Sir Dal Square episode was an instance of secular iconoclasm. If we take, for example, the role of the Stars and Stripes, the US flag, and many of you may remember, the first act was a ladder was brought, a US Army captain climbed the statue and smothered the face with the Stars and Stripes. This was seen immediately as potentially embarrassing and the flag was quickly replaced with the Iraqi flag. The use of the Stars and Stripes in that capacity has itself a particular history. Um, the, it has to do with the elevation of the Stars and Stripes in the United States to the, the status of a national icon, something that happened after the American Civil War. The flag was given the status of a uh, de facto religious icon. In fact, the US Congress had to say about the flag in its um, two, in 2007 pronouncement, the flag represents a living country and is itself considered a living thing. The flag has a very particular history. It was used for the suppression of dissent in the First World War, where uh, heterodox Americans, such as communists, were forced to kneel and have their face covered with the flag so that they could kiss it. So th the veneration of the flag as a national icon has a long history in the United States. The flip side of that is that there's been a number of court cases in the United States by those who refuse flag veneration as an act of idolatry. In the 1990 case, for example, um, in 1990, when the issue of flag burning, whether or not it was permitted to, to burn the flag, was debated in the US Supreme um, uh, Court, um, the proponent in the law case denounced the flag as a golden idol. In 1943, for example, the Jehovah's Witness brought a case to the Supreme Court um, about, uh, resisting being forced to venerate the flag. Um, and it was accepted that the flag by the Supreme Court, but in a landmark ruling, that honoring the flag was in fact uh, honoring it as a sacred icon and compelling the Jehovah's Witness to venerate it uh, forced them into an act of idolatry com com comparable to the worship of the golden calf. So what I'm suggesting is that we need to think again and not fall into an easy uh, binary opposition between religious and political. Neither of these acts were fully religious or fully secular. Um, both had its own politics, its own particular context. Um, and I guess the larger point I would end with is that we need to be very suspicious of reductive analysis that talk about Islamic iconoclasm or uh, 
enlightenment secularism. He could be suspicious, he could be suspicious, I would say, of both of those things. And I'd say if you take anything from the episode of the banner on Buddhism, it should be that. Just to round up, uh, I think I should ask Llewellyn this. Um, two ongoing questions. The, the um, existence or not of a horizontal Buddha as described by Hugh and Sack. Do you think it's still there under the rubble? Or do you think it, it, it's, it's just a, a scribal error in, in, in the translation of the text? Um, re with regret, I, I, I think that it's uh, I, either, no, uh, that it's a scribal error. I mean, that's such a tragic thing to say, isn't it? We have a, a, a thousand foot monument and it's just um, the result of a scribe making a, a, a mistake with his uh, digits. But I, I think that's probably true. There, there's quite an interesting... They did find a, a small horizontal... They, they, fa they found a, 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 the, the archaeologist who was desperate to, to fi find this, a chap called uh, Tazi, who's uh, Afghan French, um, did find, it was looking very, very hard, did, thought he'd found something rel related to the larger one and didn't, uh, didn't pan out. Did find a, a smaller um, uh, dying Buddha, uh, about 10 meters long, uh, I think. But 10, 10 meters isn't the same as 300 meters, so he was a bit... 10 meters is quite nice. It's, it's yeah. not bad, I mean, you know, if you're looking for it. There, there is a, there's a theory, there's a, there's a, a, um, there's a volcanic um, feature quite near to uh, Barmeon, which has uh, a religious... Um, well, it has a myth associated with it to do with um, Ali um, in contemporary times, and has for a long time. And there was a theory, which is quite appealing, that that might have been, that might have been turned into a, a Buddhist symbol. So that might have been turned. It's a long, low volcanic, long low hill with um, with very with yeah, sort of various volcanic kind of effects, um, bubbling water and stuff coming out of it. And that might have been turned into a reclining Buddha, a Buddha reclining on his deathbed. But there are there are problems with that with that theory. And, well. and the issue is rebuilding the Buddha, as some have suggested. Well, it's a it's it's. It's a, it's, a, it's a hot one, it's a live one. Um, you'll have seen, there was, there was a report recently about um, a, uh, a, a German NGO which rather naughtily re reconstructed one of the Buddhas in such a way that it looked like their feet. Um, uh, they said it's just coincidental that it looked like feet, uh, I think. Um, there are lots of people who want to reconstruct one of the Buddhas. Um, if the, the rather sort of critical issue is that the, it will lose its status as a world heritage site, uh, as I understand it, if any reconstruction um, uh, flouts the rules that the U UN has about reconstructing monuments. So it would have to be done very, very carefully indeed. It would also cost a phenomenal amount of money, and one does really have to wonder whether the millions and millions, tens of millions of pounds that we would be spent reconstructing one of these Buddhas um, is the best way to spend tens of millions of pounds in, in one of the poorest areas of um, Afghanistan at the moment. If I, if I could just add to that, I mean, that would, I think, justify retrospectively the Taliban's you know, rhetoric for this, because if you remember, the Taliban spokesman for the UN said at the time, look at the international community, willing to give millions of dollars to save stones mm -hmm. while our people starve. And that is essentially a reasonable question. Now that they're destroyed, it's yeah. done. So do we really want to spend millions of dollars rebuilding a hermit-wrapped Buddha while Afghanistan lies in ruins? This seems to me like too bad. I, I, I don't think. Could I just come back? I mean, the, 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 there was aid going to, to, to Afghanistan at that point, and the Taliban were probably the main, one of the major reasons why there was a famine in, in Afghanistan, because they were at war with various people. So it was rhetoric. It doesn't make it any less uh, as powerful as rhetoric. But it, it was rhetoric with its own, with its own uh, agenda and, and political. But yeah, th I think the arguments against rebuilding the Buddhas are overpowering. Any questions for Toby in the back there? Hello. Uh, excuse me, I've had the right microphone now. Hello? Yes, yes. Good. Uh, I think it was Robert Byron in the 1920s criticised the Buddha from the aesthetic point of view. Yes. Is it just gigantism that has produced this symbolism that they, they now hold? Were they really? It's a lovely quote, isn't it? You said yes. it's as if they gave a load of Hellenized navvy stick actors, gave them some horrible gendarme Buddha and told them to get on with it. Yes. 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 Yes
comments? Well, um, yes, I mean, to, 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 to a large extent, I think the, the, the celebrity of the, of the footage was to do with their, their size and their, their location. Um, it, it, they are really in the middle of, of nowhere. They're in the middle of great mountains. You're, you're traveling, um, 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 in, if, if you're not traveling by plane, you're traveling um, uh, through, through difficult sort of passes to get there. You're suddenly in a very sort of verdant valley and the cliff is, is turning to, to hooded. I think that, that's, that's, that's the major source of it. Um, I mean, he was, he was a terrible snob, having, <laughs> having said that. And he had his, his, his own very clear idea of what, what, what it was appropriate to find in, in this part of the world. And in an Islamic part of the world, it, it wa this wasn't what he, he wanted to find. Uh, Go Goethe says quite similar things, actually, with those less, without the, 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 the personal experience of, of Islamic people. Actually, a lot has been said about the uh, last phase of the Bamiyan Buddha, the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddha. My uh, doubt is from the uh, construction phase of the Bamiyan Buddha, actually. It's more an architectural doubt. Uh, during the uh, time when the Buddhas were being constructed, actually, uh, there was there was actually pre-Islamic anti-Buddhist activity in the region. It has been extolled in uh, many Persian inscriptions. The Zoroastrian high priest. Is this like no, no clearly in play at all. Yeah, um, there was actually during the construction phase of the Bamiyan Buddhas, there was a pre-Islamic anti-Buddhist activity in the region. Uh, Zoroastrian high priests from the Persian Empire has actually licensed uh, vandalism of Buddhist temples and uh, monasteries. So my question is. Uh, even though the Persian influence in the region at the time was disruptive, how is it that Sasanid architecture actually found its uh, Sasanid arch architectural concepts found themselves in the statue itself? Or is there a difference between Bactrian architecture here and Sasanian architecture? How did Sasanian architectural that influence seep into the Bamiyan Buddhas themselves? Well, well I mean, uh, more in the wall paintings. More in the wall paintings. Yeah. I mean, uh, what, what is really fascinating uh, is to is to study the the iconography of the of the wall paintings, in particular the ones that don't exist anymore over the in the in the at the top of the um, alcove where the where the buddhas were. You just have to say, I mean, for those who don't realise, as well as the two mm. Buddha niches, there are I think a thousand caves. Yeah, 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 yeah. A thousand caves, many of which were uh, the majority of which were facing. Including the caves in which the Buddha is set Including up. Including the caves, and, and the niche above the Buddha yeah. had a particularly complicated Zoroastrian Greek Elios. Um, yeah, I mean, it, there are all kinds of, I mean, the, the Sasanian influence and, and possibly even some Egyptian Greek but influence on the, on the imagery. To compare it, there are only 26 painted caves at Janta. So there are thousands of So we can, uh, we are made to assume that the architects were a combination of people from many nations at the time. Well, I, you, you, can, you can assume, I mean, the question was, can you assume that the architects came from many nations? I, I don't think you need to assume that. I think you just uh, assume that the, the people that were there um, were influenced, you know, had, had, uh, had received influence from all, all kind of areas. There's, there's, there's a parallel, actually, in the, um, I mean, look at the, um, the Begram Hall, the Begram Hall, which um, is a, a, apparently a, a merchant um, hall surviving from, from the early uh, centuries AD. <coughs> And there's a big, there's a big question about it. Is it the various features? I mean, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stuff in many cases. Is it? Are they all imports? You know, are they all coming from the Mediterranean, Central Asia, and India, and Russia, or are they actually being made? Begum is north of Kabul, so are, or are they being made by highly skilled artisans <coughs> who inherited these influences from all over the place? And there's an interesting argument based on whether a particular goat is native to the Hindu Kush, uh, which is all connected. And stylistically very close to Kant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the, same, the same form of the gateway that you get in, yeah. in, in the yeah. statue. Yeah. So we don't, don't, don't play down the potential of the, the, the locals that, that, are, that are making these things. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to stop now. The good news for looking outside is that the sun has come out. So after lunch, normal service will resume. <laughs> A big round, please, for two gentlemen. Well and Morgan, very glad. Please join me in thanking our sponsors for the session, the Aga Khan Foundation, our speakers, Llewellyn Morgan and Barry Hart, and our chair, William Dalrymple.
We start our next session in five minutes. Wordsmith, the power of words in five minutes. Our other program, we've got three venues running. The Mughal Tent, where we...